Okay, so here we're going to talk about sepsis, the silent killer, and mainly focusing on the size of the problem. Okay, so I always like to compare sepsis statistics to cancer because everybody knows about cancer. You've either had a family member or a friend, or you know, at least somebody that you know that has had cancer. And obviously, cancer you know, is rightly regarded as, as a major killer. So in 2014, which is the most recently available cancer statistics, there were nearly 36,000 deaths from lung cancer. There were over 11,000 deaths from breast cancer, nearly 16,000 deaths from bowel cancer, and over 11,000 deaths from prostate cancer. And those are big numbers. Well, what I'm going to tell you is that sepsis, it kills people and it maims the survivors. For any football fans amongst you, this is a photograph of a Villa Park uh, stadium, which is the home of Aston Villa FC in the middle of Birmingham. It holds nearly 43,000 people. Well, you can actually fill this stadium and the people spilling out onto the street with the number of people that die from sepsis in the UK every year. So to put that into context, that's more than the number of people that die from lung cancer. And it's more than the number of people that die from breast, bowel and prostate cancers combined. In that figure, we have 1,000 children that die from sepsis each year, and worldwide, it's the leading cause of deaths for the under fives. Now, the big issue with this is actually a lot of these deaths are avoidable, a lot of the harm that results from sepsis, it's avoidable. So, many people who have sepsis may well have some other health problems that mean that sepsis may well be you know, a natural uh, end of life path for them. but. There are young, fit, healthy people who die from sepsis, who really should not die. We are talking a figure of around about 14,000 avoidable deaths across the UK, and that's just not good enough. Okay. And even if you do survive, survivors are left with medium to long-term health problems, which affects probably at least 20% of those who survive it. And we sometimes call it post-sepsis syndrome. Okay. Now, this figure of 44,000, I would say that is at least, because we can't be convinced that clinical coding is picking up all the sepsis cases. Okay? And indeed, there are some suggestions that the true figure may be closer to 60,000 deaths. And that's horrendous. Okay? We are awaiting the publication of updated figures, but that's sort of stalled at the minute. Continuing on the sporting theme, just down the road from us is the Principality Stadium, the good old Millennium Stadium, and it holds 74,500 people. Now, in 2016, we would have said that there were 150,000 deaths from uh, cases of sepsis in the UK each year. So you could fill the pr pr Principality Stadium twice over and have people spilling out onto the street with a number of sepsis cases. Okay? And it affects people of all ages. It affects, there are 10,000 cases of sepsis in children, and it is a major direct cause of maternal death. And to add to that, the incidence of sepsis, it's increasing across the developed world by between 8 and 13% per annum. Now, the latest figure suggests that that 150,000 figure is a significant underestimate. So this report by the Whitewater Charitable Trust was published in February this year by the York Health Economics Consortium. They now estimate that the true figure for the number of sepsis cases across the UK every year is 260,000 cases. Okay. And as you can imagine, not just thinking about the personal cost to people, but the economic cost to the country, it's enormous. And they looked at this and found, if you simply looked at the costs to the NHS of sepsis care, we're talking between one and a half and two billion pounds. That's just to cost the NHS. Cost to the, to the country as a whole, somewhere between 11 and 15.6 billion pounds. To put that into a Welsh context, we're probably talking 12,500 cases of sepsis. And again, depending on what mortality figures we look at, it could be 2,100 deaths or maybe higher, 2,850. Um, so we're talking a co direct cost to NHS Wales between 53 and 94 million pounds. And the cost to the Welsh economy of you know, over 500 million pounds, could be over 700 million pounds. So those are large sums of money. And yet, better sepsis care could save the Welsh economy, £126 million pound as a bare minimum. So I mentioned post-sepsis syndrome, sepsis survival, affecting you know, a large number of survivors. And there's a wide range of physical problems and psychological problems. They are at risk of recurring infections and further episodes of sepsis. Now, of course, some of these problems do overlap with their IC ICU morbidities, but 
given that sepsis is one of the major reasons for people to end up in ICU, that's not surprising. Wide range of physical problems, lethargy, poor mobility, breathlessness, hair loss, taste changes, changes in sensation, etc. And then the psychological problems can be quite devastating too. Anxiety, depression, flashbacks, nightmares, post-traumatic stress disorder. And one of the things a lot of sepsis survivors will complain about is the inability to concentrate. You know, whereas before they could concentrate on tasks for, you know, hours on end, they now find their attention span is very, very short. They simply can't concentrate any longer. Now, we talked a lot about figures, but what we haven't said is what is sepsis? Okay, well, so the basic problem is you can't measure what sepsis is without defining it, and therefore you can't know whether what we're doing in terms of trying to improve the care and looking at the outcomes is improving without measuring it. Therefore, we need a definition. So I qualified in 1985. We did not have a sepsis definition. We did not have a sepsis definition until 1992, when the first sepsis definition, now called sepsis 1.0, or otherwise known as the bone criteria, were published. And they talk about systemic inflammatory response syndrome, something that we've sort of grown up with over, you know, the years since, since then. And it talks about the combination of SERS plus infection equal in sepsis, and then severe sepsis and septic shock. So that was not bad, it was a good start, but there were clearly some issues with the definitions as used. So a lot of sort of head scratching in international meetings went on in posh hotels and they tried to sort of refine the definitions. And in 2003 they said, well, we can't really do much better than we got at the moment. But they did expand the symptom list to include things like hyperglycemia and altered mental state. But of course the problem with SIRS, so we've known this all the time, is that SIRS is, one, is an appropriate you know, response to an infection. So is it an appropriate response to anything else that causes inflammation, such as trauma or various autoimmune diseases? So on that basis, it's you know, certainly not be all and end all of sepsis. And indeed, some surveys suggest that many as one in eight patients in intensive care units with infection-related organ failures, which we would call clinically sepsis, would not fulfill those criteria of having two or more sepsis cri uh, SERS criteria. So we know that SERS is wrong. Okay? So, after a long period of discussion and heated debates, in February last year, they published the third international consensus definitions for sepsis. Okay? And they said the sepsis is defined as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. So that's quite a key phrase in the definition. So it's talking about the body's response to infection and it being dysregulated. So this is something which is not normal. And in lay terms, it says, sepsis is a life-threatening condition that arises when the body response to infection injures its own tissues and organs. And I think that's a very good way of you know, saying what sepsis is. So this is infection that's life-threatening and you're injuring your own tissues and organs. They then went on to say that septic shock is a subset of sepsis in which the underlying circulatory and cellular or metabolic abnormalities are profound enough to substantially increase mortality. And that could be... You could operationalize the definition of sepsis by saying that uh, an increase in something called the sequential or sepsis-related organ failure assessment, or SOFA for short, score of two or more points, is associated with the in-hospital mortality greater than 10%. Okay, so sepsis kills. And they then wanted to say that septic shock can be identified as clinical construct of sepsis with persisting hypotension requiring vasopressors to maintain a mean arterial pressure of 65 millimeters or more and having a serum lactate of more than 2 millimol per litre despite adequate fluid volume resuscitation. And with these criteria, hospital mortality is in excess of 40%. So we are talking a major killer here. Okay, So sepsis alone, 10%. Septic shock, 40%. So what's changed in these definitions? Well, I said one of the first things is that SERS has been removed from the definitions, so we can say it's, it's out. And they've taken away this term severe sepsis, which, fr quite frankly, wasn't that helpful. And they tried, to, they tried to introduce a concept called Q-SOFA. And I think it's probably fair to say the jury is still out with regard to Q-SOFA. Okay, so SOFA is a system of categorizing severity of illness in patients in intensive care based on organ dysfunctions. Okay, and so I'll show you a slide in a second that shows how complex that is. Uh, the uh, people who devised the third sepsis definition then tried to distill out from large electronic databases what were the sort of key factors that might tell you that somebody has sepsis. 
And so they came up with this concept called Q-SOFA, where they looked at you know, a low blood pressure, a high respiratory rate, and altered mental state, and said if you have two or three of these criteria, then it may well be that you've got sepsis. So this is SOFA, and I see it's an enormously complicated um, tool to use. And you need a lot of laboratory information, lots of calculations, and realistically, the chances of making this sort of calculation at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, let, lo let alone 2 o'clock in the morning, it's about zero, okay, when a patient ill in front of you. Okay, so, you know, but we can use it to look back at what's happened to patients and say, well, yep, yeah, they did have these organ failures and they had an infection, therefore they had sepsis. Okay, so what are QSOFA? Is it actually useful? Does it work? So this is the QSOFA. Some of you might recognize some people on here. Um, but the problem with QSOFA is got, we're talking about these physiological abnormalities which could occur in other situations. It's actually not that specific in terms of an individual abnormality. So what else could we do? Well, across Wales, we are lucky in that every acute hospital uses the National Early Warning Score. Okay? And you can actually calculate the equivalent news to a QSOFA score. Okay? And indeed, a QSOFA of two or more would be a minimum news score of three, uh, four. Sorry. And indeed, on that basis, the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, UK Sepsis Trust, and NICE have all said, yeah, actually, QSOFA probably is not as cracked up to be, and we'll stick with using uh, a news. Thank you very much. So what have we been doing in Wales? Well, as I already said, we've introduced news across every acute hospital site in Wales, and now it's out in uh, ambulance practice with the paramedics, it's going out into care homes, etc. Okay, and one of the key focuses of the RAILS program, the Rapid Response Acute Illness Learning Set, is to look at sepsis care. Okay, and delivery of sepsis care using a bundle called the Sepsis 6. And indeed, we can actually show that it's had some success. So, the arrow in the box show you a time when news was rolled out across all 18 acute hospital sites in Wales. Uh, we've seen a reduction in sepsis mortality based on clinical coding data. Okay, so we've gone down from 29 to 24 percent, which is less than the mortality for sepsis in England. And indeed, it was actually recognised uh, by the Global Sepsis Alliance at the 2016 awards, where NHS Wales has awarded the uh, prize for the Governments and Healthcare Authorities category. So, good for us. Okay, so, you know, we can sit back on our laurels and think we've, we've cracked it. Well, sorry to say, we haven't. Okay, so in 2014, um, using medical students from Cardiff Uni, we did a study we call Size of Sepsis in Wales. And basically, there's a 24 hour point prevalence survey looking at the recognition, diagnosis, and treatment of sepsis. We sent med students out in teams that came from the Cardiff University Research Society. And what they did is looked at every patient who was either in the hospital or admitted in the 24 hour period who had a news of three or more, and they were screened for sepsis. So, in just two, two health boards with four acute sites, they identified 2,716 patients who uh, were admitted, 312 had the requisite new score, 51 of whom had sepsis. Only three of those 51 patients received the sepsis 6 within the prescribed one hour. Only seven were seen by critical care, and only two of them were admitted to critical care. So that was quite an interesting study, um, certainly rattled a few cages. It was quite a difficult process to go through because it needed a lot of paperwork to be filled in, transcribed into computers, etc. So some of the students who were involved in the process, uh, very, two very bright guys, uh, devised a digital process to collect the data. Uh, and we call this the Welsh Digital Data Collection Platform. Uh, and this enables you know, secure data entry with some uh, help for them based, based on access to things like uh, the British National Formula, etc. And uh, it runs on a very cheap Android tablet. So that was published in uh, 2016, and that enabled us to conduct the size of sepsis in Wales part two. So this was the middle of June 2015 now. So we sent out 184 medical students across Wales, okay, to collect data, identified over 5,300 patients admitted in that 24 hour period that we were in. 146 had sepsis, and 144 had severe sepsis using the old definitions. Okay, so we're talking a combined prevalence of 5.5% across NHS Wales. Okay, and indeed that group had a 90-day mortality of 31%. Okay, so higher than other 
diagnoses. Okay, were we any good at delivering the sepsis six? Well, I'm afraid to say we still weren't that good. So if you look at you know the best figures, so oxygen was given to 60% of patients with severe sepsis, but only 29% with sepsis. Blood culture is only done in 30% of cases of people with sepsis. So really, we're nowhere near being at a high enough level of compliance to say that we're delivering this package of care properly. So we need to do better. And indeed, if you look at the delivery of the sepsis 6, in the sepsis category, only 3% of patients, and in the severe sepsis category, only 9% of patients fulfilled the definition of having the sepsis 6 delivered within one hour. Screen tool completion, 10 and 16% respectively. So really not that good. Okay, so we need to move on, and obviously these new definitions are coming in. So in October last year, we conducted uh, a study we call this defining sepsis in the wards, or we may call it size of sepsis part three, if you like. Okay, and part of, the, part of the aim of this is to compare old versus new definitions, and then to look at the utility of the variant scoring system that we could potentially use for identifying sepsis. Again, same at-risk population, news of three or more with documented uh, clinical suspicion of infection. We identified 380 patients who fulfilled the criteria. Okay. If we'd used sepsis 1, we'd only picked up 212. If we'd used sepsis 3, we'd picked up some more, 272. But if we'd used QSOFA to screen them, we would only picked up 50 patients. So I think QSOFA is probably not that great. 85 patients were admitted to either to intensive care and or they died, because 22% of the patients. Will we any good at delivering the sepsis 6 care bundle? Well, sorry, we're still not that good. You know, 13% of patients receiving the sepsis 6, depending on your definition, whole cohort, 11.6%. So there's a lot of work still needs to be done in recognizing and delivering timely sepsis care. But on the other hand, we've seen this drop in mortality. So, you know, what can we say? You know, it's good, but it's not right, okay? We must do better. So what about our scoring system? So obviously we've seen on quite a small subset of patients the um, utility or otherwise of uh, news and QSOFA. Uh, a large study from the University of Illinois was published in uh, April this year and they've got a huge database of elect electronic observations recorded for several years. So they identified nearly 31,000 patients on the database who they had full data for. And what they found was that while SIRS had a high sensitivity, it was poor specificity. QSOFA was highly specific for sepsis, but had a very poor sensitivity. It would have led to delay in treatment for many hours, if at all. Okay. And indeed, NEWS appears to be the best compromise. So this is a plot of, sort of uh, uh, areas under the curve of receiver operating characteristics, if you like. And indeed, both in the emergency department and in the wards, NEWS seemed to be the best performer of the systems they looked at. So, sepsis, treatment, time is tissue. Now, we've known f f for several years and practiced for several years, you know, rapid delivery of treatment for acute myocardial infarction with thrombolysis. We were talking about improving door to needle times and now door to PCI times. The same urgent care needs to be applied to sepsis. In May this year, uh, New York State's Department of Health published the results of a study that they conducted. New York have changed their sepsis care process in the last few years following the Rory Staunton case, uh, where they now mandate that they will deliver sepsis care in a timely manner within six hours of the emergency department presentation using the care bundle from the surviving sepsis campaign. So their target is slightly softer than the sepsis because they talk about a three hour bundle rather than a one hour bundle. Okay, So they looked at the mortality rates accordingly. They identified over 49,000 patients who presented to the hospitals, of which nearly 41,000, or over 82%, had their three-hour care bundle delivered within that three-hour time frame. So it is possible to deliver better care more quickly. Okay, And indeed, they found that in terms of delivery of antibiotics, the uh, median time uh, was uh, you know, under an hour. Uh, but for fluids, they weren't quite so good. It took nearly three hours. But overall, the delivery of the complete uh, sepsis care bundle from the uh, surviving sepsis campaign was 1.3 hours. Was that associated with improved outcomes? Well, certainly suggests that it is. Uh, again, if you look at the crude mortality in the top graph, you'll see that the slower 
that the care was given, the worse the outcome in terms of mortality. And that was matched by the findings for the delivery of uh, antibiotics according to their local guidance. They didn't see the same thing for fluids, which is interesting. So it may be that we need to rethink how we deliver sepsis care and maybe focus less on the delivery of, of fluid and more on the delivery of antibiotic care. So that was interesting. So again, this is going to make us think now between what we do as we change our care pathways. Where does this leave us? Well, in 2015, November, NCBOT published its report called Just Say Sepsis. And they highlighted a number of issues in delivery of sepsis care. And certainly what they found was that if you had a screening process and a care bundle approach in your hospital, you tended to deliver appropriate care more quickly, but you still weren't that good at it. Okay, so you're looking at you know, blood cultures not taken. If you had a care bundle, in 60% of cases, blood cultures weren't taken. If you didn't have a care bundle, it was nearly 80%. So it's pretty awful, really, isn't it? Okay. And again, you know, documentation was poor. Delay in administration of antimicrobials was common. In Wales, Welsh Government have, after um, some pressure from various uh, agencies, decided to implement uh, sepsis care now as a... Uh, part of the NHS outcomes framework as a tier one priority. And essentially we are now expected to collect data on sepsis care. So the number of patients screened, the number of patients who got the sepsis six, and those who received the diagnosis uh, screening but didn't get a proper diagnosis. NICE has also been involved. And in July 2016, they published NICE guidance NG51, sepsis recognition, diagnosis, and early management. And they essentially looked at everything and they constructed some algorithms for timeliness of care depending on risk stratification by high, medium, moderate and low risk. And they sort of broke this down into sort of various age categories and maternity cases as a sort of special subset of that. So the question we have to ask ourselves is when our patients in front of us, they run well, is it sepsis or is it just an infection? Because infection is common and sepsis is far less common. Of course, any infection can lead to a local inflammatory response, but it could also lead to a systemic inflammatory response. And sometimes we have this patient who's ill in front of us where this clearly got a systemic inflammatory response, as shown by their observations, but you don't know where the infection is. So again, if you see that and you don't know what's going on, think, could this be sepsis? Where, you know, could my patient have an infection? And use a screening tool to try and work it out. So we've had sepsis screening now for a few years following the RAILS program. Okay, based on the SERS criteria, as we've said previously, but of course, SERS is dead in the new definitions, so we need to do something different. What do we do? Do we use KOSOFA? I don't think so. Okay, do we use SOFA? Ooh, could be tricky. Okay, what about news? Is news good enough? Okay, well, we think so. Okay, but the proof of the pudding is going to be in the, eat in the eating. Okay, so. The UK Sepsis Trust, in conjunction with NICE and these um, moderate and high risk categories, devised these amber and red flags, which you see on the new screen too, which will be launched later on today. Okay, so this is so far as I showed you this earlier on. This is very clearly not a screening tool. You know, I say you're not going to be do working this out at uh, you know 2 a.m., 2 p.m. in the afternoon, let alone 2 a.m. in the morning. Okay, and the okay, so is that a screening tool? I don't think so. Okay, so the new tool, which uh, Gemma Rouse is going to talk to you about later on, is going to look like this, and she'll tell you the details. Okay, so what we need to think about now is, you know, what is the evidence for my patient with an infection showing signs of end organ dysfunction? Do they have what we'll call a sepsis red flag? Okay, or are they not quite so sick, but they're certainly slipping into organ failure, what we might call an amber flag? Okay, so if we have a red flag, you need to be delivering the sepsis 6 within one hour of recognition. If they have amber flags only, then think about it. Have you got the right diagnosis? And if, and if you have, treat them. And if you haven't, then obviously maybe something else going on. Okay. If a patient has acute kidney injury in the face of infection, it elevates it to a red flag severity and you need to treat it. Okay. So we've got some idea of what we should be doing. What happens if we get it wrong? Well. We've already said 44,000 deaths across the UK each year that we know of, okay? Uh, you know, at least 25%, if not more, are preventable by appropriate early recognition, diagnosis, and treatment. We get it wrong. We leave families devastated, we leave, and we leave those who survive traumatized. Some of you may have seen the Panorama program that was shown on Monday night, 
and this gentleman's in the program. This is Tom Ray. So Tom had sepsis. It was not recognized in a tiny manner, certainly wasn't treated in a tiny manner. And Tom, as a result, you can see the facial disfiguration, but he's also a quad amputee as well. And it's taken him a long time to rebuild his life. Uh, his story is featured in a film called Starfish the Movie, which is available on all good download sites and uh, every, your favorite DVD stores. Okay, and he's just actually released a book, and he's actually in Morriston Hospital this afternoon doing a book signing. Okay, but that's the sort of consequences of it, and you'll hear more when Jane comes to talk to us in, in a little while. Any questions?